Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, my name is Sarah Mendelson. I'm head of Heinz College in Washington, DC. This is the third session of our public discussions. Today, we are joined by Maha Juwayed, former acting director in the Access to Justice Office at the Department of Justice. And our topic is leveraging international engagement to advance justice at home, reflections on what works. And before we get started and I um, talk a little bit about Maha's background, um, I wanna remind everyone that uh, you can use the chat function to enter a question. Uh, we'll go through a number of topics uh, before I turn to you guys, but please be thinking about what it is that you would like to um, discuss or ask Maha. Um, so Maha is an independent expert on access to justice, working with a number of nonprofit and multilateral organizations, leveraging her experience with the federal executive branch on justice policy. She's currently a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and she's a fellow with NYU's Center on International Cooperation. And I'm gonna pause there just to say that there is an announcement that the center she is associated with uh, is going to announce on Saturday uh, as part of the Global Citizens Live concert. And I'm gonna drop a link into the chat function, but if you just Google Global Citizens Live, um, you can find all the different ways that you can watch this. And this is a big annual sort of festival about the sustainable development goals. But on Saturday, the Pathfinders, with which uh, Maha works, are going to announce a, a partnership, uh, a new initiative to support people-centered justice, which is exactly what we're gonna talk about in a second, through legal empowerment. Um, so this event, uh, this Global Citizens Live is gonna be live streamed from New York, Paris, Lagos, Dubai, and more. So it, it was really a festival, um, for global citizens. Um, now, until January 2018, Maha served as the acting director of the US Department of Justice's Office for Access to Justice. That's the primary office in the executive branch focused on supporting indig indigent defense and civil legal aid for low income and underserved communities. And while at DOJ, she represented the US government as its indigent defense and legal aid expert in bilateral settings and multilateral meetings and negotiations at the UN, OIS, OECD, OGP, that's a lot of acronyms, the United Nations Organization of American States, the organization of what's OECD stand for? Economic Cooperation Development, yep. And the Open Government Partnership with whom we partner on many issues and the International Legal Aid Group. So um, let's get started. Maha, what does it mean exactly to advance people-centered justice and how is that different from other forms of justice? Thank you so much, Ambassador Mendelssohn. And first I wanna uh, say hi and, and appreciate the opportunity to speak to your students today. Really, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to share some of my experience um, for individuals interested in maybe uh, going into government one day or just understanding how government approaches these issues. So people-centered justice is really a new way of conceptualizing how we view legal processes so that it's responsive to both the legal needs and the capabilities of people who have a legal problem. And what that really can be kind of distilled down to is our, especially in the US and our formal legal system is quite complex. You, you usually need a lot of knowledge, information, let alone probably a legal degree to be able to really interact with the legal system in a way that allows you to respond to your problems and hopefully resolve them. And we know that's not true. Often people are coming into, into contact with the legal system uh, without recognizing, you know, without knowing how to go through it, but also sometimes not even engaging with the legal system because they don't recognize their problems are legal in nature. So the idea of recasting our justice processes into ones that are people-centered really means approaching the design of our justice system to become one that really is responsive to what people actually need to be able to resolve their problems. 
And in the US context, it's often aligned with the notion of access to justice. And what we mean by that generally is the demand side of justice, meaning individuals who come into contact with the justice system who has who have legal issues to resolve, either criminal or civil. And I'll just break that down a little bit more um, uh, for the sake of um, the, the, the further conversation we'll have. You know, in the US, in our criminal system, our constitutional law has developed to make clear that if you are charged with a crime by, you know, obviously by government, it could be federal, state, local, tribal, and you can't afford a lawyer to defend you, then the state has the obligation to provide you with that lawyer. There are some asterisks where that doesn't happen, but generally in the context of when you have the risk of losing your liberty. On the civil side, where you're maybe interacting with the legal system because of an eviction proceeding or a family issues such as divorce, a child custody issues, um, or even a benefits issue like you're a veteran or you have social security benefits you need, those are all civil issues where you're not being charged by the state. Government may be adverse to you, but you're still not being charged and being potentially put away in prison or even face the death penalty. In those instances in our country, there's no obligation that government provides you with a lawyer. And of course, there are instances in which people can get help. It might be free help through civil legal aid offices that are remarkable, that exist across the country. Some of them are federally funded, some of them aren't pro bono legal services, law school clinics, um, even self-help resources that are developed to help individuals be able to navigate themselves. So in any case, we have this sort of bifurcation in our, in our legal system in the US between criminal and civil, when you get a lawyer, when you don't. And all of that sort of, all those issues together, we consider to be a sort of bucket of access to justice issues. And when we add into it, the people-centered justice conversation, we're thinking about not just getting lawyers for people, but also thinking about ways in which we can make these processes easier, sometimes less lawyer intensive, less court intensive, and ways in which people themselves might feel empowered to be able to resolve their own problems. That's incredibly clear. Thank you so much. There's a lot of work at Heinz College about making sure people, communities know what kinds of benefits are available to them. There's a lot of benefits that go unaccessed. Um, either because they're technical issues, digital issues, people just don't know. So I think it's very much in that, in that work stream. Let me ask you, um, going off script, a question. Is there a country out there or a community where you think people-centered justice is, there's an excellence in people-centered justice? That's really, it's a great question. I think the real excellence around people-centered justice often, often relates to um, less formalistic justice systems. So, and I, what I mean, and I actually hate these terms because we, we need to use them sometimes just to distinguish, but they sometimes feel a lesser than. Um, for example, I think indigenous traditional justices in the US are very people-centered, that you actually have, um, you know, for example, peacemaking processes, many different indigenous um, nations in the country have that, but I'll think of the Navajo Nation, where actually people are coming together in a room trying to resolve their issues in a holistic setting. Um, but the other ways we can think about um, uh, people-centered justice in a more Western-minded style is to think about those in which you have um, one-stop shops, places where you can come in and you know, you're not just turned away because you came to the wrong office to fill out a paper a form, but that you can come to one place where in fact you can resolve or try to try to resolve your legal issue of the day. And it could be something for drivers, like a, a you know, parking ticket to something more. And those are sprouting up across Europe and also obviously in the US. I mean, the wonderful thing about the US, I should say, is our legal system is complex. There's a lot of problems, but because we're such a large country, we have 50 states and territories, the traditional, I mean, indigenous communities and and not, we have lots of great examples within the US that allows us to pick and choose at times to see what's working and what doesn't. And so there's that notion of the, you know, laboratories of democracy across the country. I think there are a lot of great examples also within the US too. Very interesting. Um, it does feel like between bureaucracies and legal frameworks, you can get really caught. Yes. And so um, I think, you know, 
being part of a campaign for people-centered justice makes a lot of sense. Uh, and of course, the entire concept of sustainable development has its roots in indigenous communities, right? This is not something, I mean, it may have, in the end, people think of it as the UN, but it, it has deep, deep roots uh, in communities around the world. Let's turn to the creation of the Access to Justice Office, because that was really something new and, and different. And maybe start with the background on the office, as well as its current status. But describe, particularly because this is a course on how ideas become policy and getting stuff done, describe the how of how the office came together and the successful strategies there of and the what of what it did. Because I think there's so many of these strategies for success that are applicable way beyond the access to justice office, way beyond the Department of Justice, and frankly, beyond even government. It's, there are a lot of strategies that are good for almost any kind of campaign, social issue, political campaign that you'd want. Yeah, for sure. You know, really, I feel so fortunate. I was with the office essentially its entire existence. I mean, I shouldn't say fortunate. I'm, I'm sad it was closed. but. The office was launched in 2010 and by Attorney General Holder under the with the support of President Obama and then closed regrettably in 2018 by Attorney General Sessions. But it had a really big mission and it was to address the access to justice crisis in the civil and justice um, civil and criminal justice systems in the US. And so what did that actually mean? I mean, it was a policy office that meant we didn't have funding to disperse. We weren't a grant making component within the federal government. So we weren't dispersing funds to try to achieve that goal. We also didn't have investigative authority where we could investigate the lack of counsel being provided by different jurisdictions. Um, instead, we had to be really creative. And you know, being a new office in an old bureaucracy, it meant that we continually had to try new strategies to try to ultimately find success. And so that was the fun entrepreneurial aspect to the office that over time we were able to test out different theories of change and really found the ones that were most effective for our work. So I'll, I'll just share our main goals with the office were to really support the, the, the providers of access to justice services. We were not an office that um, was, we weren't a complaints office or an ombudsman for individuals who were who who needed more support for executing their rights. Um, you know, we had a, obviously a public facing component where we tried to help the public, but it wasn't as if it was a 1-800 number you can call and ask for support. So instead, really we were looking to increase funding and resources for both public defenders in the US and civil legal aid um, lawyer, uh, uh, service providers in the US um, also individuals in the sense that self-help resources. So if we could find ways to support less court intensive solutions, that was part of our strategy as well. So increasing funding and resources, advancing federal policy where they were an obstacle to trying to achieve those goals or, or even when they were not an obstacle to try to put policies in place that would allow for increased um, opportunities to provide these services encouraging other offices across government that did have enforcement authority when it was appropriate to consider how they could try to um, protect and safeguard the ability for individuals to you know, um, access help when, when required or permitted. And then also grow the evidence base, data, federally funded data uh, collection research, really critical to be able to really build the case for what we were doing. And over time, we really settled on, on a number of successful strategies. We include leveraging the shared priorities of other offices, um, the convening authority. You can imagine when the Department of Justice convenes both external experts as well as experts across government, it could really it comes with a lot of authority, also public statements in that regard. Um, finding validators and champions in other parts of government. You know, one of our favorite pastimes was finding who was the former public defender or former civil legal aid lawyer. They were really so critical for our success because it was a shortcut. You didn't have to explain what it is that we were trying to do. Um, using international mechanisms, which we'll talk more about, that was my favorite strategy. And then also just serving as the access to justice expert within the department. And that meant as the department and the different offices were filing court briefs, developing and advising on federal regulations, legislation, guidance that we were part, we were in the room 
to advise and provide a perspective that until the office was formed wasn't wasn't present. So let me pull out a couple of threads um, because they're they're sometimes not people may not realize that they're important in terms of getting stuff done, but and so some of this is what you didn't have, but is found elsewhere, and some of it is, it is what you did have and and you leveraged it. The money issue, um, you know, four years at USAID, and I think sometimes people think AID doesn't have a seat at the policy table, although now, of course, it, Samantha Power is represented at the National Security Council. But having funding is can be a big leverage and it can and really help you uh, in an interagency conversation. Um, that being new in an old bureaucracy, having stood up uh, a new center inside an old bureaucracy, that is a big challenge. Um, the information piece, the data, the evidence-based, I think over time, this is going to become increasingly important or it should be. And that's why we think CMU and Heinz students going into the workforce are gonna have specific data skills that are really gonna help. Um, but you know, finding your friends, <laughs> this is really pulling forward lessons from grade school, but in that, that, you know, finding folks who have shared priorities and making common cause with them is incredibly important and helpful. Um, so I think that's, that's great. So let's dial in a bit on this. What does it mean concretely to leverage international engagement or international law to advance justice in the United States Let's talk about it in broad terms. How do we harness the power of international law to drive domestic change? We're in an era where on the one hand, we clearly have crises domestically in terms of our democracy. There's lots of bodies of international law, but there's also controversy about applying international law at home. Um, and of course, we have this framework that we have been talking about over the last couple of weeks and, and, and this week, and well, we're still waiting to see to what extent the Biden administration um, elevates this, but the sustainable development goals, you know, to what extent, how, does, how do the SDGs fit in all of this? That's a lot of different things. So I'll pause and, and you can yeah. pick and choose. No, no, it's great. It really is. I mean, what's remarkable is when the office was formed in 2010, it was explicitly charged with, quote unquote, exchanging information with foreign ministries of justice and judicial systems on access to justice. So it was baked in from the start that the office should be considering engagement in international settings to advance a very domestic agenda, that the office was charged with improving access to justice here in the US, not elsewhere, but that we would engage with others as we tried to do that. And so there's a number of benefits to this, and I'll just, I'll name a few. The first is just, there's practical benefits to having those conversations. Peer-to-peer peer -peer exchange means that you really get to learn about innovations happening elsewhere and thinking about when they could be applied here in the US. And that's just, you just expand the tent of thought and thinking to be able to really improve what could happen. And, you know, out of the recognition that you know, human rights are universal. We can also think about solutions to their deprivation as being universal. There's diplomatic benefits. And, you know, it's really remarkable because when the office was formed, it was formed with a very clear statement of there being a crisis in access to justice in the US. And so formal speeches, public speeches made by the attorney general and others always talked about the problems in the delivery of justice services in the US. And when we went to international settings, we didn't change our talking points. So we were saying the same things, that there's a problem in the United States. And that just created some oxygen for others to say the same thing. And I, I was in more than one meeting where there was surprise that the US was coming with talking points that we weren't getting it right. And that in other areas around human rights, and of course, aspects of access to justice may or may not be viewed as human rights, but still, in these conversations, there tends to be this, oh no, why are you telling us what to do? We know what to do. But if the US is coming and saying with honesty, we also aren't doing it correct. Some instances we are, but we need to do better. That creates just space for real honest conversation. 
And so that was really remarkable to see and experience. And it's true still today. I, in my other work since leaving government, I continue to see that this space provides that openness for, for different actors to talk about it with honesty, especially governments. But the top benefit for the work that we were doing in our office was that it was a lever. It really was a fulcrum to do things that we couldn't do. There was a but for aspect to engaging with international actors and international systems that allowed us to get our work over some you know, humps that they were close to, we were close to achieving success in certain areas, but we had now additional pressures being placed on, on the work because of this international something. And you know, really it harkens back to this notion of champions and other parts of government. Really it was you Ambassador Mendelssohn. I know you spoke with Ambassador Cousins. I know you're speaking with Tony Pippa. These are people who really helped us connect our work, especially to goal 16 in a way that allowed and recognized the universal nature of this framework so that the success of our work was the success of the SDGs and their work as well. So a little bit more about Goal 16 and why it was so critical for us. You know, we had this very large, and it continues to exist today, interagency effort that had over 20 agencies coming together to explore the ways in which federal programs might incorporate civil legal aid services to further federal priorities around anti-poverty. And there's, there's a whole thing around that. And, I know that sounds like a lot of shorthand, but just the bottom line is we have lots of programs to advance healthcare and education and housing. And there's a lot of evidence that including a legal component to those programs often is the missing ingredient to get success there. So bottom line, we had this really remarkable interagency effort co-led by the White House and the Department of Justice. And we were hoping and working to get a presidential memorandum that enshrined, formalized this work, which would really allow us to encourage the agencies to do more. Because I'll, I'll say the office that I came from stood this effort up and staffed the effort. So the presidential memorandum is like an executive order and you know takes a lot to get those things out the door. And it was in the process, but by connecting through the really creative conversations within government with all the same people that again, I, your students are really fortunate to be able to hear from, by connecting this domestic activity to this international framework and Goal 16 in particular, which had these access to justice element, really I believe is what unstuck the presidential memorandum and got it signed by President Obama on the eve of the SDG summit. It directly connected the work of the interagency to helping the US implement Goal 16. And um, in addition to just the fact that it helped get it over the, over the finish line, it also created a new, um, requirement mandate for the interagency and that was to think about data collection in ways we hadn't or we were unable to really encourage the agencies to consider and that's because of course the SDGs comes with a mandate to to collect data for international indicators but also to consider domestic national indicators and so that really allowed us some real exciting opportunities that sort of pause under the last administration that hopefully will come back up soon enough so many threads there. This peer-to-peer -peer, uh, approach is really built for right now. Um, it, and you're right, it is quite unusual. I, I've been in the room when American officials are saying things that international delegations are surprised at because they're used to a certain way of talking about American officials talking about the United States, which, you know, in a post-Trump era in a COVID era uh, is impossible. I mean, I, I think we've, and, and I think the Biden administration has has embraced this. Um, so bringing humility to the room is extremely important. So it, in some ways, 2010, you guys were way ahead of the game and the, and um, Attorney General Holder was, was, was really out there um, being able to talk honestly about obviously the problems in the United States, and he continues to do so to this day, um, particularly focused on gerrymandering and, and um, access to, to voting. Um, but there's also, I just want to point out for folks, the, 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 let's say the gold or the money of having a presidential memorandum or an executive order. It doesn't always work. Um, I spent most of 2008 
2007 and 2008, working on an effort with lots of lawyers and colleagues on how to close Guantanamo. Mm. And on the second day of President Obama's um, administration, he signed an executive order on closing Guantanamo. And obviously, this is an ongoing um, challenge. So it doesn't always translate right. to getting it done. But anytime you have the president's attention, whether that's in a speech or in an executive order or any kind of when we had this whole atrocity prevention effort that was signaled by the president saying, okay, you have 90 days or 120 days to come back interagency with a plan. And the bureaucracy pivots. Um, and I think we'll see that today, later today, where there's a summit on uh, COVID. And, and you will see the US government in the days ahead, hopefully with lots of other governments, pivoting to truly bring um, an end to this the situation. So th that's all incredibly um, helpful. Let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about specifically different, some other elements of justice. Number one, lessons on restorative justice from the international context that can be applied to the United States. Where do you see opportunities to advance restorative justice in this country? You've spoken, I think, a little bit about indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. But how and how is it different from, you know, I'm more familiar with transitional justice from my work around the world, particularly in Russia, where countries, communities are reconciling with violent episodes of the past, not always successfully, but there's a whole menu of how you would do this from amnesties to truth commissions to all sorts of indigenous and local ways of coming to terms with what has happened. Um, and we are obviously still wrestling with this. There's lots of international menus to choose from. Uh, and we don't do enough, I think, of, of understanding what's gone on outside and applying it to here. So a couple of questions on restorative and transitional justice. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's super, there's a really great question. And I'll, I'll just first start by, by just sharing, you know, the US, system generally is a is an adversarial system of justice where you know generally and hopefully you have lawyers on both sides of an issue where they're zealously advocating on behalf of their clients and, and at its best it's really remarkable and you can imagine when you have two corporate actors and they can you know hire top gun lawyers that can you know proceed for them it's really a remarkable system but there are also instances where that doesn't happen. Many in times it's when it's relating to individuals with um, low income or underserved from underserved communities. And so you can imagine a, a mother dealing with an eviction proceeding goes to court and the landlord is lawyered up and she's not. And that's just a very unfair system, potentially, if she has defenses or she needs some adjustment. I mean, obviously the COVID pan the pandemic is there's a cascade effect right now. We're going to have a tsunami of evictions that occur because of everything that everyone's been dealing with. So, you know, in, the, in addition to that, there's also instances in which, again, the research shows that sometimes people just don't know that they have a legal problem. You know, people will get a notice about potentially eviction and they'll ignore it for a time because they're not sure what to do next. And so, again, our system is really well designed for lawyers. It's not necessarily designed for individuals with needs who don't understand the law. And so thinking about these other processes, as for example, restorative justice, is really critical to create a holistic legal system that can respond to legal issues and needs in different ways. And so while there's no one definition of what restorative justice means, generally it's viewed as um, the ultimate goal isn't to assign blame or punishment, it's really to make both sides whole again. And so while there are instances in which restorative justice might feel unsatisfactory or even potentially harmful, I'm, and I'm reflecting on you know, issues with respect to uh, domestic violence or sexual assault, where you know, having the a victim and a perpetrator in a room together to talk it out may not be ideal, both for the victim, but also to process rights for the, for the offender. So ultimately there are instances, instances in which we may feel like restorative justice may not be the right approach. Although I will say people who really believe in this would have good counter arguments to what I've just said, that ultimately thinking about problems between neighbors or family, 
you know, those are, there are issues where we can say, why would they have to call the cops or go to court and resolve those through a very formalistic system when potentially having a mediator in the room and, and trying to go through a different process that looks different than what we're used to, uh, what we see on TV, what we study in law school could, could make the, all, the, all the difference and, and ultimately bring down the stakes to resolve a legal problem. And in addition, you know, the transitional justice processes that she mentioned, you know, again, countries coming out of conflict and repression, addressing large scale human rights violations. These are really critical ways to consider how to create harmony again and balance. And so, you know, if there's a truth and reconciliation commission or international prosecutions or reparations or some combo, you know, really there's a, there's a whole array of processes that we can see from South Africa to Northern Ireland, where they've really achieved good opportunities and success for, for the, their communities. And of course, in the US, there's a lot of discourse around the need of traditional justice for you know, our, our historical wrongs, our original sins of slavery and genocide. And so again, as someone who believes that human rights are universal and that we can think about all of these issues in, in a way that's holistic, I, it's important to think of legal systems and justice systems as a spectrum that we, there are certain things where there are hard lines, bright lines, where we shouldn't allow for a process to inhibit or harm someone's rights. I'm thinking about some traditional practices which aren't great for women. So certainly we, we should pick and choose and think soundly. And for me, human rights tends to be the ruler. Other people disagree with that, but if, if if you think about fundamental human rights, for me, that's the measure for deciding and, 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 just, and interpreting whether or not a different practice could be appropriately translated into the US system. But all to say, this spectrum of, of responses are wholly appropriate, wholly appropriate for us to consider as we try to improve our own system here at home. So traditionally, there's, uh, and certainly in certain pockets of uh, government institutions in this country, there's hesitancy about the U.S. applying international standards um, to domestic issues, um, whether we're talking about international conventions and even the most casual student of Congress knows how difficult it is to get certain treaties ratified. Um, but how, how do we turn that around um, to, as you say, get stuff done. How do we make the business case, if you will, about the importance of international law, recognizing that many colleagues, both of us, have been involved in the creation of international law? Uh, I mean, that's the sort of bizarre piece of it. Um, no Clinton administration lawyers and probably no international criminal court, even if we don't belong or have, haven't signed on to the Rome Statute. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, this this is the thing that's so remarkable. The United States is behind much of the international, uh, the development of international standards, treaties, tribunals, and yet there is this real hesitancy around engaging. So, to your point about criminal, the international criminal legal system, from Nuremberg to the modern day international tribunals for Yugoslavia, Rwanda, uh, international criminal court, they were sculpted and developed by US expertise. And even US law was incorporated into some of these processes. And you know, international human rights treaties were again, also developed with the expertise of US experts. And so this hesitancy to consider these standards, these laws is at odds with the very fact that the US was in the room and influences so much of those conversations to have them developed. And so there's a little bit of a risk in not participating fully and that is, at some point, you're not going to be invited to the party anymore. You know, as much as you can engage, uh, you need to engage on both sides. And so for me, it often feels fear-based and sort of the wrong version of U.S. exceptionalism that we will not engage with these processes. And not to mention that our, our U.S. Constitution places international treaties as uh, a supreme. It's in the supremacy clause. So there's, there's a real disconnect with all of that. But you know, really, uh, the business case and why bother? I think it, again, I can point to really concrete examples, especially for policymakers in government looking to try to get their work done. So, 
for us, again, as a new office, connecting with some of these international practice, uh, engagement elevated the work of the office. You know, there were many instances in which the US has to file treaty reports and looking for something to say in these reports. And we were, we were very eager to put our work in those reports. So I, I hate to confess, sometimes we really got a lot of play just because we responded to those, you know, large emails that went around asking people to provide input. And if people are busy, they may not provide input. So in some ways we kind of overly played our work just because we were responsive. Um, also, it increased resources uh, for th this, these constituencies that I mentioned who we felt were really the beneficiaries of our work. In particular, the UN has the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. It sits in Vienna and meets annually. We found a lot of success engaging through that mechanism, through that, that, um, that commission. And in fact, coincidental or not, at the time our office was formed, these UN, the first principles and guidelines on criminal legal aid were being developed at the UN. And so we were pulled into that and engaged in that and were able to then ensure that the US perspective was included in those conversations. And those resources are really important for US public defenders today, not least of which there's a development of, a, of the first um, criminal defender network, international criminal defender network in the works that came out of that work. You know, there's an international association of prosecutors, nothing exists on the, on, for, for defenders. And again, all of that work together is really helpful for the defender community. Um, I'll be a little quicker now with the rest. It institutionalized and elevated our engagement on civil legal aid. I just gave the example of goal 16 and how it connected to the interagency effort. And again, improving federal data uh, collection and developing the business case through our engagement with different multilateral organizations, including the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. But really the most important, and this one hurts a little to confess, is that it protected the work of the office beyond the office's existence. So while we were unable to prevent the closure of the office, it really connecting the interagency effort that the office was staff, staffed to do through the, through the Obama presidential memorandum, connecting it to goal 16, allowed us to get the Obama memo, which then continued to exist even after the office closed. I mean, the Trump administration never rescinded that memo. And even though the memo says the, the interagency should meet three times a year, they didn't do that. They met three times in three years, which is success. I mean, really the fact that anything continued to happen in this area for us who cared about this work, you know, seeing your work, the worst thing is to see your work go away. And so seeing some of this work continue on, even in a more muted fashion was really for us, vindication of at least in principle that our work was bipartisan and it really mattered. So all to say that goal 16 connection was a savior for, for the work because it allowed the work to continue on even beyond the, the office's existence. No, I totally hear you about the continued um, living and breathing of an institution that you helped to create the Center of Excellence on Democracy, Human Rights at Gover and Governance at USAID, which we launched in February 2012 after a very large change management exercise. It's going to have its 10th anniversary in, right. in February, and it's gone through congressional review, went through the Trump administration. It, the business case for that office, I guess, made sense for people. And so you're right. I mean, and sometimes in a large bureaucracy like the US government, being able to even just to continue the existence under the most difficult circumstances is, is important, which let's turn actually to the Biden administration. Sure. Um, how do you rate the chances of the reopening um, of the Office for Access to Justice? What's been happening to date? Um, and how, how, does, how will it look differently in, let's say it happens in a couple of weeks, or let's say it happens in 2022. Actually, it would be a, be a good deliverable for the Summit for Democracy, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, what's different between what the office is doing in 2010 from now? And, you know, yeah. obviously we've been through the COVID crisis and everything else. Yeah, for sure, COVID's the, the top the top line issue. 
you know, it's it's really exciting because actually in the spring, President Biden reissued that presidential memorandum I mentioned from President Obama, and he didn't need to because again, it, it existed. It didn't ha- it didn't go away, and as as long as one president doesn't rescind some another president's work, it it continues to to be enforced. So excitingly, he reissued that memo. It also t- called on the department and the attorney general specifically to to restore the functions of the office that was closed. And importantly for this conversation too, that goal 16 connection remains. It was still there. The interagency continues to be tasked with engaging around goal 16 or helping to implement it. A couple other things to flag is that increase the number of agencies, that's fantastic. It's now 28 from 22. And that the first, and to your point about COVID, it also mandates that the sort of first issue that the interagency consider is specifically around COVID response, how federal, um, how the federal agency's response to COVID has an access to justice element. And actually, they they already tasked themselves with issuing a report. So the report's due around now. So hopefully we'll see it soon and see how they're describing the work of this interagency. And at the same time, the attorney general also is due to the president a report on how to restore the office. And you know, initially the language was a bit vague. Is it the functions of the office? But I think we're at the stage of really recognizing it's, it's going to be restoring the office. And the reason why I can say that is because you know, every spring the president or late late winter or spring, the president will issue a budget. It's a very important policy document. And I did not fully comprehend the poli- the, the budget. And I was in government for about a dozen dozen years. It took me about half that time to fully then realize how important the president's budget is. It is a policy tool that like no other. So all to say the office is in the president's budget and it, you know, the, the, the funding level is much higher. It would have much more staff, many more staff. So, you know, it remains to be seen, but it very much looks like it's in the works that the office will be reopened. And I will just also flag, you know, so what it will do, hopefully we'll have these reports come out soon. I think ultimately it's it's likely to be a policy office still, but maybe it will have funding authority. I don't know, maybe it'll have enforcement authority. I don't know. But I will flag that there is also draft legislation that has been introduced in both the House and the Senate bipartisan legislation, which is again, remarkable. And again, for this conversation, it also continues to have an international element. In that draft legislation, it says that the office would consult with the Secretary of State and serve as a central authority of the executive branch on access to justice. So there is a um, real opportunity to continue to think through how this work can be advanced. What I really hope and, and expect is that the U.S. Re- recommits to being a global leader on justice once again. You know, for these last years that I've left government, these conversations have continued to happen. It's not as if the U.S. exits and then everyone stops having the conversations. The work continues on without the U.S. in the room. And the U.S. has a lot to share about justice systems and legal systems. We have a lot of problems in the country but also we have a lot of solutions and innovations that other countries look to, to be able to try to improve their own system. So the peer exchange is important also externally in terms of the ways in which we can engage diplomatically with our, with our allies and non-allies to try to improve the situation of people's being able to access their, their rights. Your point about the budget is so well taken. I think it was President Biden, perhaps as a Senator who said something along the lines of, show me your budget and I will show you both your values and your priorities. Um, so that, that, that budget, and this gets back to the money question or issue, um, it really is uh, a fantastic tool. Um, if you have the, the most grand plans, but you don't have the budget behind you, that, that's not a strategy, it's not a viable strategy. Um, and we're going to come to all of you soon, so please be typing in your questions. Um, but in the meantime, is there? Can you point to other countries that have stepped in to the void? I mean, I, the, the World Justice Forum is going to occur at the end of May and beginning of June, um, and I think uh, I certainly hope to be able to go. I hope to be able to take some others with me. Um, so the Netherlands emerges as a obvious um, leader in, in the world of justice. And I think The Hague thinks of themselves as an SDG 16 city. Um, 
on some level. Um, but I mean, is is that right? Would you say that the 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 Netherlands in particular? For sure, the, the Dutch really, you know, hats off to the Dutch for really advancing this agenda. They they have put a lot of resources into trying to support the global conversation around justice, and they are also trying to connect it back to their domestic activities. So one of my clients, one of the organizations I work with is the Open Government Partnership. It's actually through my collaboration with the Pathfinders and um, for another day to explain more about how OGP works, but to say the Dutch did for the first time last year or the beginning of this year, included in their commitments around open government, a commitment on open justice tied to their ombudsman complete system. And that was really a reflection of the universe trying to, I don't know, I can't say I know what their motivation was, but there is, it was a great example of them both externally doing all this work on the global stage, but then pulling it back to who and what they are in terms of practicing what they, what they preach. But there's lots of great examples. I mean, Canada has been doing really remarkable work and um, they actually have created their own access to justice secretariat. They launched it in 2019 and it's a small office, but wonderful colleagues that actually, when I was in government, we had a lot of engagement with our DOJ colleagues in Canada. And so Canada has really stepped in and um, they've also hosted and convened high level meetings you know, this virtual world that we're in, you know, Ambassador Mendelssohn, we were talking, there's pluses and minuses to doing these Zooms. One really is actually sometimes having a two hour meeting, just be two hours, you don't have to fly somewhere. And, you know, of course, there's also lots of really important conversation that happens on the margins that you can't discount. But in any case, Canada has been really um, remarkable in hosting those sorts of conversations as well as more technical level meetings with, you know, um, government, director level positions having conversations to do that peer exchange but then you know and I keep, the list goes on but there really are I keep looking like this because I have a list of countries on my wall these are the OGP countries that I work with and I can mention some in, in in Africa as well Kenya has done some really remarkable work around developing access to justice work and one more to mention is Sierra Leone they're developing their own access to justice secretariat I will just flag that too I feel quite proud that the U.S was one of the first countries to put forward an, a dedicated office on access to justice that has then become not necessarily a model exactly for what the office did, but a model in the sense of having a dedicated central authority on this work so that since that time, we've seen many more offices being developed and organized across the, across the globe. And so I know that in Sierra Leone, Canada, um, Albania, I think there's there's a few examples across that demonstrate that commitment and understanding. No, it's a way of moving the issue not only in the U.S. context but internationally. If you have, if you will, a belly button, you know, a central location for where these issues are going to be fielded, that's incredibly important. I will note that OGP yesterday celebrated its tenth yes. anniversary. Um, I was there at the creation, um, a little bit skeptical. There's a blog somewhere in the internet of me Googling my way to Google. Google was the place where they hosted uh, side events for the, the launch of OGP and, and Google actually had the wrong address for their <laughs> New York location. Um, but, uh, and OGP is gonna have a, a, one of the big sort of justice areas and forums and democracy platforms that will happen over the next year, OGP will have their 10th anniversary summit um, in um, South Korea in, in December, um, which actually gets us to the Summit for Democracy, which will take place virtually slightly before then. How do you see all of this fitting into the Biden administration's vision for the Summit for Democracy? I mean, to what extent, you know, I think a number of organizations, including colleagues at the World Justice Project, succeeded in getting specific targets on access to justice adopted in the SDG context. Um, I think it's 16.3.3 maybe, but at this point, there hasn't been the knitting up yet of 
the Biden administration summit for democracy and this agenda, despite many of us suggesting that <laughs> there's a lot of food for thought in the SDGs that could be helpful. And that likely in any country that is invited to the summit for democracy is gonna be actively engaged in advancing the SDGs as every OECD country, the whole G20, 200 plus voluntary national reviews have been um, issued. The United States to date is the only peer country that has not. Um, but how do you see the SDGs and yeah. the Summit for Democracy? I mean, this, to me, it's just a clear clear connectivity. And, and I, I'm hopeful, you know, the, the summit, uh, as you said, it's, it's in December, it's virtual, it's for two days, but with the goal of having, you know, hopefully an in-person, um, version next December 2022. And between now and this December and December and next December, there's a whole notion around creating national commitments that, you know, whoever's being invited, the governments that are being invited, as well as the civil society organizations that are engaging, can use these events as a, as a real lever to um, create new commitments. And I'll say we used to have a, we used to have a phrase, we can't take credit for it, but that we would call it policy by event. You know, events are really painful to organize. They, they create, they take a lot of effort, a lot of effort. And in this virtual age, they're even more stressful because, you know, as a pastor of Middleton, I'm on, my, I'm on my phone to do this because earlier my computer seemed wonky. So there's a lot, there's a different level of stress these days with the doing events, but all to say they're not worth it if people are just gonna come and say something. But what we really, and what I mean by say something is to say the same thing. Like that's not useful, useful policy activities. But what events can do is create opportunities to do new policy. And because often people want to come and announce something new, it's, a, it's an opportunity to have quote unquote a deliverable. And so what I think the Summit for Democracy really can do is create that space and that obligation and that sort of fuel to try to get things over the finish line in the way I described the presidential memo being stuck before and then the SDGs helped to help to do that. So, you know, there's three main buckets that the summit is supposed to focus on. I'm gonna read here, defending against authoritarianism, addressing and fighting corruption and advancing respect for human rights. And to me, that's all of that is, is many parts of the SDGs, but goal 16 in particular. And you're right, there's, you know, many different targets within each of the goals. 16.3 is the access to just my favorite one is the access to justice um, target and then within that they have three indicators that go underneath that but the whole goal 16 reflects on all of these you know the whole goal 16 talks about peace peace justice strong institutions you need all of that for democracy you need all of that to counter authoritarianism corruption and advancing human rights. So, you know, here's some ideas. The, the, the legal aid interagency roundtable that, that President Biden just sort of added more fuel to, that could have a working group within it because we had working groups within the larger interagency and they can be working for the next year to create more and new commitments and activities that support this notion of, for example, advancing respect for human rights. The right to a fair trial is a fundamental human rights. And so counsel is part of that. But also we know that by having access to justice, you can ensure and fight corruption because people can, anyway, there's many examples of that as well as authoritarianism. Um, but there's many other places in which other aspects of that entire goal fits in. And so my, my hope is that there would be this recognition that there's, and again, because the presidential memorandum that President Biden just signed explicitly states goal 16, hopefully some of those connections can be seen. But it's, it's, a, it's a not, the one last thing I'll say about it, what I understand about this summit, there, there really is a desire for the US to also have commitments themselves, that, that it would be, again, this notion of universality, that the US would come with examples of ways in which it was working to improve its own systems so that we would be doing, we would be fighting and advancing these same issues as well. So there's a lot of opportunity there. You're so right that uh, summits like this, and frankly, like the one that's happening today, uh, are policy by event. And, and I think the, the really critical thing, and this is something that our open government partnership friends constantly remind us of, hammer on, 
there has to be a follow-up and review process. So the accountability mechanism is, is really critical. Um, having been a point person for the 2016 Refugees Summit uh, at the UN, um, so exactly right now in 2016, the entire year before that was spent trying to figure out for host countries to um, change their laws so that families, um, children could go to school, families could work for countries that were able to spend more money, ask them to spend more money for countries that were able to take in more refugees, including the United States. It was that, so you had tiers of requests to these countries and then those countries that made commitments were then invited to the summit. The summit that's happening today apparently was announced on Friday, which means that <laughs> there, are, there were there are very tired people that are gonna be showing up at this virtual summit on a whole variety of issues having to do with, with COVID and that this time next year, they'll come back and they'll be accounting to see whether or not shots in arms building back better things really did um, make a change. So those are incredibly helpful policy lessons. Um, we're just about out of time. Is there any, any parting shots, anything that you wanna add that you think that students should be knowing about? Yeah, it's just this, that, you know, I, I keep talking about goal 16, it's my favorite goal, it really is. But the whole agenda has a domestic component. So, you know, I understand in particular, Heinz College, you're approaching this work in a very comprehensive fashion. I just encourage that. There, there could have been so many different examples in which the U.S. was adapting this international framework domestically. And the truth is they were. It's not, again, the interagency effort wasn't created to respond to Goal 16 as a sort of deliverable for Goal 16. It was just aligned with that work. And so similarly, as you go forward in your interests and your areas of expertise and move forward in your professional uh, life, just to consider there's always ways to think about the sort of connective way, connective tissue across all of these, you know, whether it be anti-poverty, climate, you know, change related agendas that we know are part and parcel of what we're trying to accomplish through international engagement and multilateralism. But it's really been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I, I sometimes, you know, you wish you're a student again. I wish I could be studying this work again because it's, I feel today, it's not as if I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, when I study, but there's so much more now that is that is out there on the ways in which this engagement exists. And I really think there's a whole space to develop more and more work that no one's ever has, has considered yet. So. Well, the transnational in the 21st century, I think is so much more obvious, whether it's from a pandemic, whether it's because of technology, um, whether it's because there are all sorts of development issues that every community is experiencing, uh, including around racial justice. And so these barriers of somebody who works only domestically or only internationally is really, as one boss used to say, yesterday's breakfast. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, old, <laughs> it's an old way of, of doing things. Um, so we're definitely hoping to uh, partner with um, students, young people who seeing seeing the world differently and understanding the opportunities and the challenges, both that cut, cut across, um, not just here or there, but frankly, everywhere. So um, thank you, Maha, so much for spending yeah. this time with us. Um, we have our last session is um, next week, and it's with Tony Pippa from the Brookings Institution. And we're gonna be looking at um, sustainable cities uh, and what's working where and why. Um, and there's a whole suite of examples um, from across the globe that uh, including, I would say Pittsburgh that he's gonna be pulling on uh, and that we can share with you. Um, and we have um, uh, our own Zoe who's working with Tony Pippa. And so will have some particular insights um, that she can share with us. But it's a very exciting uh, 21st century agenda that is placing cities really at the, at the center. So we look forward to that. In the meantime, 
please be safe and stay well and we'll see you we'll see you next week bye thank you